good. God is so of our lectureship for the Tri-City School of Preaching in Stony Creek Church of Christ. And we have a number of folks visiting here today and we wanna say a special welcome to you. And we have a number of speakers today at the appropriate time. Chris Casebowl, our preacher, will be introducing them. If uh, for everyone, let me say this, that uh, there is a bookstore on the other side in room three. And there's a table there that has free books on it and then there's a table against the other wall. Those are not free. <laughs> and so make sure you properly distinguish. We're very grateful the Coopers are here. For those of you who are visiting, let me say again, uh, you're welcome. And let you know that the School of Preaching is a work of the great Stony Creek Church of Christ and has been such for 23 years. And for that, we're extremely grateful. I'll turn the service over to David. Good morning. Welcome to our services. Thank you all for being here. Uh, just a few announcements as we get started. First of all, the teen class is going to stay in the auditorium this morning, so all the teens stay in here. There's also a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board for t-shirts for our VBS coming up, and that list will stay on the bulletin board till about the end of May, May 29th or so. Uh, so if you want a t-shirt for VBS, please sign that sheet. Uh, keep the sick in your prayers. Those that we want to remember are Mark Garrison and Betty Craft. Also, David Jones had a bone biopsy this past Thursday. Keep him in your prayers. And also, Doris Estep is a friend of Eddie and Patsy's, and her son, Danny Estep, has cancer in his eye. So keep that family in your prayers. There are several events coming up this month. I have uh, the Secret Sisters are going to meet today at 430 here at the building. Of course, our lectureship begins today. Also, there's a gospel meeting at C Street that begins today. The Ladies' Day for Stony Creek is going to be April the 13th at 8.45 a.m. On the 14th, after our evening service, is the wedding shower for Annie. And everyone that comes, please bring finger foods for that. On April the 19th through the 21st is the Spring Retreat for High Rock. April 27th is the 16th Annual Spring Formal. And there's a flyer on the bulletin board uh, back there in the hallway. April the 28th is a youth rally at the Morristown Church of Christ, and there's also a flyer for that, too. Two other things that were added. On April the 13th, there's going to be a work day at High Rock, and this is going to start at 8 o'clock. If you show up at 9, they're still going to put you to work, so remember that. And also, April the 11th, the ladies' class that normally meets on Thursday evenings will not meet this week because of our lectureship, so keep that in mind. That's all that I have. Thank you. Scripture reading this morning comes from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 35 through 40. Women received their dead raised again to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourging, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. <clears throat> God, have, having provided something, be some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Good morning. Before we have our opening prayer, we're going to sing a few short songs that I've spliced together. Let's all join in together and sing. Um.
Dear God, we thank you so much for the blessings that you've showered on all of us. We're honored to be in your presence this morning and to worship you here. We pray you'll look into our hearts and see the commitment that we have and see the desire that we have to worship you properly, that everything that we do or say will be in accordance with the pattern that we find in your New Testament gospel. We, we know the power of the gospel, and we appreciate the power of the gospel. We pr we're thankful, God, that you've allowed us to live in a time when we don't have to experience what they did in these scriptures we read in Hebrews chapter 11. That was a terrible time for them, and we are so thankful, God, that we have, that we can enjoy peace when we worship you. We're thankful for all the blessings that you've given us. We're especially thankful for this Stony Creek Church. We're thankful for all the members here. We pray your blessings on all of them. Some of them have sickness, some of them have problems, and we pray for every single one of them that you'll bless them as they have needs. We thank you for this Tri-City School of Preaching. What a wonderful blessing this is to the church. We pray your blessings on all the students, the instructors, on the directors. We thank you, God, that it exists. And we pray that it'll go into the future, putting men out there to spread the gospel along when many of us have died. There are some that are sick, and we pray your special blessings on them. We have, we have those that we love that are on our hearts right now. And we pray you'll bless them as they have needs. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In just a minute we will break out and go to our classes. We're going to sing number 249, How Precious is the Book. That's where we should be teaching from all the time. How precious is the book you find, my He is a 2021 graduate of the Tri-City School of Preaching, and currently he is preaching at the East Side uh, Church of Christ in Morganton, uh, Georgia, supported by his wife Molly and his two boys Ethan and Remy. Now he is an Alabama enthusiast, it pains me to say that, but do not, do not allow that to detract from his preaching. He can bring it, and he's going to this morning. Our topic, our theme for the lectureship this year is Jesus Christ, the center of the Bible. And we're going to 
a look at how Jesus is represented in each of the 27 books of the New Testament. And so this morning, Robbie is going to speak to us about in Matthew, Jesus is the King of Kings. Brother Robbie, the floor is yours. Good morning. It is a delight to be back here with you to enjoy this time of, of study. This lectureship is, is just going to be uh, wonderful. I'm thankful to the school, thankful for each one of you and your presence as we uh, dive in to this topic of Jesus being the King of Kings as Matthew presents him in his gospel. Now, I tried every way in the world to get Chris to say Roll Tide, and he wouldn't do it. So he is a man of conviction. But uh, nevertheless, uh, the book of Matthew, I want you to think that there were 4,000 years of expectation after all of the noise that God had made through Moses and Joshua after all of the noise that God made through the 480 years from Moses to Solomon's fourth year in 1 Kings 6 and 1 when he began to build the temple. God made a lot of noise through the prophets until Malachi laid down the pen of inspiration and then 400 years without a word from heaven. No prophet no angelic messenger, just deafening silence. Yet promises made spanning all the way back to the Garden of Eden uh, have yet to be fulfilled. Abraham, the father of the Hebrew nation, was given a promise in Genesis twenty-two eighteen 18 that through his seed all nations of the earth would be blessed. Isaiah seven fourteen, Emmanuel has not come. The prophecy of Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign upon David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it in uh, justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. Yet, the ungodly Romans have uh, taken every corner of the globe through taxes and sheer muscle, and have crushed God's people. And they've made a real mess of things. And through all of this, God is silent. Oh, the Jews remember the vision of Daniel, and they remember the interpretation thereof. They've studied it, and they know that this has to be the time. What is God waiting on? They remember that God was going to do some new thing, Jeremiah 31, 31. And they have been ready for it. They recall the power that was promised uh, to come in the outpouring of God's Spirit and, and the salvation and deliverance that would come from Mount Zion in Jerusalem, Joel 2, 28 through 32. So much is riding on God's promises. They're starving for a move from God. They're ready for the Davidic kingdom to continue just as promised. These Romans have got to go. When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of woman, made under the law to redeem them, that are under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons, Galatians 4, 4 and 5. God breaks the silence. A messenger from heaven broke the silence when Zechariah was told that Elizabeth would bear a son. Standing at the altar of incense, that old priest of God who was doing this duty that he would only do this one time in his life has a face-to-face -face with Gabriel. Six months later, Gabriel speaks to Mary and then to Joseph in a dream. Jesus is born, he lives, and he dies. 
He's raised and exalted to God's right hand. And some 25 years at the minimum, Matthew records his gospel about Jesus. Matthew's Galilean gospel proves that Jesus is this long-awaited king. The one whom men are to hear in all things. Deuteronomy 18, 18. He is the king of kings. So let's begin. In Matthew chapter 1, Matthew opens up with this powerful proclamation. The record of the genealogy of the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1. This would be the most exciting news of all time for a Jewish auditor. 41 generations, the most important factual basis, legal standing for establishing exactly who a person is in Israel. This lineage establishes Jesus' royal heritage, tracing back to King David and to the covenant with Abraham, two of the most significant figures in biblical history. 1,200 years after Abraham, when Israel was established in the land, God made a covenant with David, promising that his dynasty would be established forever and one of his descendants would reign on his throne forever, 2 Samuel 7, 11 through 16. And from the outset, Matthew sets the stage for Jesus' role as the long-awaited Messiah, the promised king. He uses this kind of language and literature. The word kingdom is used 55 times in this book. The, the word kingdom of heaven, that phrase is, is found 32 times. The title king is used 20 times. And the phrase son of David is used nine times. The Old Testament expectation of the king was on this wise, the lineage of the king. The first mention of the Messiah as a king is found in Genesis 49.10, where Jacob prophesies that the scepter will not depart from Judah or a lawgiver between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall be the gathering of his people. Then there's the symbol of the king. In Numbers 24, 17 and 19, the prophecy states, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. A ruler will come out of Jacob. You see, the scepter is a symbol of kingly authority, uh, indicating the Messiah's royal status. You remember God in Hebrews 1.8, Under the sun, he saith, Thy throne is forever a scepter of righteousness. And then there's the role of the king in the anticipation of the Old Testament. In Psalm 2, 7-9, God declares the Messiah as his son and promises to make the nations his inheritance and the ends of the earth his possession. The Messiah is portrayed as a king who will rule with justice. And then there's the mission of the king. In Isaiah 42, 1 and 4, it describes the mission stating, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. He says, I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not falter nor be discouraged until he establishes justice on the earth. So this passage portrays the Messiah as a king who will establish a kingdom that is, uh, brings justice upon the earth. Every page of Matthew's gospel is steeped in this theme of promise and fulfillment. More than 130 times Matthew alludes or quotes the Old Testament. The typology between Jesus and Israel, uh, the purpose of this lesson, or time will permit me to get into that, but uh, 
we'll need to continue. In chapter 2, we see this, uh, the Magi and the king. We encounter the story of these wise men who journeyed from the east to find the newborn king. Their question, where is he that is born king of the Jews? And this ignites Herod's jealousy. Herod's subsequent order to kill all of the innocent children, it reflects his um, perception of the threat of this king and the Magi's homage and their gifts affirm his regal identity. A king wrapped in rags is still a king. And in this case, he was the king of kings. An animal's feeding trough was a king-sized bed. And so the saying is true, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions, Luke 12, 15. Jesus' kingship was not contingent on material matter or human opinion, but on who he was, on who the Father said he was. The same is true for you and I. Or is who you are in Christ sufficient for you. As we move on, we're going to jump to, to chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. This famous sermon where Jesus articulates the principles of his kingdom. He teaches here with authority, declaring blessings on the poor in spirit, on the meek, on those who mourn specifically over their sinful uh, actions and peacemakers. Jesus really challenged conventional wisdom in this sermon. He emphasized inner righteousness and loving one's enemies. That's radical, isn't it? And in doing so, Jesus reveals himself as the king whose reign transcends earthly power structures. He admonished their distorted interpretation of God's law in chapter 5. He scrutinized their practice and corrected their errors in chapter 6. And he taught them about uh, right judging and drew a judgment scene in chapter 7 where he is the judge and the king and the magistrate over this final proceeding. And all of that was in the context of Matthew 5.20, exceeding righteousness what his kingdom, what his kingdom subjects were to be about. He ended chapter 7 with an admonition to hear and to do his words in Matthew 7, 24 through 29. This revolutionary teaching astonished all that heard him. Not only did Jesus teach as one having authority, Jesus lived out his authority. In chapter 8, we come to the beginning here of uh, Jesus' miracles, and uh, as Matthew records them, and Jesus demonstrates his kingly authority as he calms the storms, as he heals the sick, as he cast out demons, time and distance do not prevent his power. These miracles underscore his dominion over creation and over the spiritual realm. The crowds marvel, asking, what manner of man is this that the seas and the winds obey him? Indeed, he is the king whose authority it, it, it surpasses all human comprehension. Just a touch will stop the bleeding. Even though the people laughed him to scorn, Matthew 9, 24, his simple words still raise the dead. The king of kings was so manifest that even the blind men recognized him and they received their sight. He needed no staff like Moses. He needed no mantle like Elijah. He needed no instrument but himself. His word alone healed the sick, cast out demons, turned water into wine, and raised the dead. In chapter 12, 
In chapter 12, we, we see him reprove the Pharisees for their condemning the guiltless. And he claimed authority to have uh, even authority over the Sabbath day. He heals a man with a withered hand. He claimed to be greater than the temple, Matthew 12, 6. He claimed to be greater than Solomon, Matthew 12, 42, and he told the truth. Jesus is the King of Kings. In Matthew 13, Jesus begins his teaching in uh, parables. And he features a series of parables illustrating the nature of his kingdom. Things like the parables like the mustard seed, the leaven, the hidden treasure, all point to the transformative growth of God's kingdom and its citizens. Jesus' teachings emphasize humility, mercy, and forgiveness. As king, he invites us to participate in his kingdom and live out these principles in our life. The parables are a significant part of Jesus' teachings about the kingdom of heaven, and they indirectly uh, show his kingship. And here's how. In Matthew 13, 1 through 9, the parable of the sower uh, describes the different responses to the word of the kingdom. The various types of soils represent different responses and actions and, uh, and, and, and how they would turn out uh, concerning the message of the kingdom of heaven. The fruitful soil represents those who accept Jesus' kingship and produce good fruits. Having that soil prepared, they actually produce. They have submitted to the rule of the Messiah. The parable of the wheat and the tares describes the kingdom of heaven as a field where the good seed and weeds grow up together until the harvest, that is the end of the age. And the king, that is Jesus, will send forth his angels to separate the righteous from the wicked. The parable of the mustard seed describes the kingdom of heaven as a, a mustard seed, which starts out small but grows into this great, uh, expansive, large tree. And this shows the humble beginning of the kingdom with some 3,000 added to the 120 on the day of Pentecost. But by Colossians uh, chapter 1, Paul said that every creature under heaven had heard the gospel and the kingdom had literally exploded. This, uh, the, the parable of the leaven in, in Matthew 13, 33, describes the kingdom of heaven as leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened, showing the pervasive influence of Jesus' kingship and his kingdom. You see, this is accomplished through our influence, though. In Matthew 5, 13 through 16, he says, you're the salt of the world, you're the light of the world, salt of the earth. Those things are um, pervasive. They pervade and they take over. And that's how Jesus gets the kingdom out and expanded today. It's through our influence. We're laborers together with God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9. Then we have the parable of the hidden treasure and the parable of the pearl of great price. And these parables, they describe the kingdom of heaven as a treasure hidden in a field or a pearl of surpassing value, showing the absolute incomparable value of Jesus and his kingdom. The parable of the dragnet describes the kingdom of heaven as a net that gathers fish of every kind and they're brought in and the end, at the end of the age the angels go and they separate the good and the bad. Uh, it's a lot like the parable of the weed and tares. 
And then there's the parable of the householder. This parable describes a scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven as a master of a house and brings out of his treasure things that are new and old, uh, things that are beneficial for every person, a complete arsenal, if you will, of learned truth to be able to lead others into that saving truth. Can I ask you, what are you fortifying? your home with? What are you filling your home with? Are you growing in the grace and knowledge whereby you are able to bring out things old and new? Are you adding new weapons of truth to your mind and growing to be able to be useful in his kingdom? In these parables, Jesus is revealing he is embalming and he is concealing the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. And while he doesn't explicitly state his kingship, it is implied in his authority to explain the mysteries of the kingdom and his role in the final judgment. In Matthew 16, Jesus promises to build his church. And he does this right after Peter makes that wonderful proclamation that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom. He was going to build his church, and he was going to allow Peter to open the door of the kingdom at the proper time. In Matthew 17, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up into a high mountain, and, and, and he appears there with Moses and Elijah. And Peter says, oh, Lord, it's good to be here. And he says, why don't we build a tabernacle, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah? A bright light, cloud overshadows them, and a voice from heaven Declaring, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. You talk about ultimate authority. You talk about the king of kings. Heaven declared it on that day. In Matthew 21, I know we're skipping a lot of great material, but my hands are tied with time. In Matthew chapter 21, Jesus enters Jerusalem triumphantly, riding on a donkey. In Mark 11 and verse 2, the Bible gives us uh, an extra bit of information. It's one that has never been written. Why is that important? What's the significance of that? For some time past, I had thought, well, Jesus rode a Cadillac. That thing didn't have a single mile on it. It was brand new. But there's more significance than that. Jesus had ridden in this chapter a beast that had never been rode. You ever tried to do that before? You ever tried to jump on the back of a beast that's never been broken? That thing's going to buck and run and spin and jump and kick. But it didn't. That donkey submitted to Jesus. Jesus is portrayed as the sovereign king of all. And he was able to mount that beast and he was able to ride it into town. The donkey is a symbol of humility and peace. Kings ride horses into war. But it was generally said that in times of peace, they would ride a donkey. And here Jesus is sit, sitting on this beast, riding into town. He's not coming into town to threaten and, and to rival Herod. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my men would fight. But Jesus is coming for an entirely different purpose. I mean, in, in this chapter, he is fulfilling prophecy. Oh, Matthew is just full of this statement. Uh, this was done to fulfill the scriptures. This was done to fulfill the prophets. 
you know, the crowds in verse number 9 of chapter 21. It says, And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You know what that word Hosanna means? It means save us. That's what they are recognizing as they quote Psalm 118.26, as they are referencing Zechariah 9 and verse 9. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just, and watch this, and having salvation, lowly, and riding upon a donkey, and upon the colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus is coming into town. And he sat upon this beast that was prophesied. And it said in Zechariah 9, 9, having salvation, what are they waiting on? These Romans have got to go. We have got to get out of the thumb, underneath the thumb, of these ungodly oppressors. And they say, Hosanna, save us, king. It's time for you to take the throne of David to remove these pestilent, ungodly pagans. His actions here, as he goes into the temple in this chapter and he cleanses the temple, it echoes the prophetic promise of the righteous king who would restore true worship. Malachi 3 and 1. And as he cleanses the temple, this Jesus, the King of Kings, practices and exerts his authority over religious practices. He is the King of Kings. One interesting point about chapter 21 that I want us to notice is in verse number 46. In this section, Jesus is telling some parables. And he is telling some parables that are very pointed in nature. And in the verse 45, it says, When the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, notice this, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. Here's a man who has demonstrated over and over and over again who he was, where he was from, and for whom he was working. Yet blinded by hatred, blinded by tradition, Blinded by indifference. They're blinded to all this. The blind men could see who Jesus was. But they have no fear of God before their eyes. Psalm 36, 1, that's their problem. They don't fear God. They fear the multitude of people. Well, if we take this, this guy out of the way, we're going to have a problem on our hands with all of these folks. Don't fear those who, cannot, who can only destroy the body. Matthew 10, fear, them, fear him rather that can destroy both the body and the spirit in hell. See, they weren't worried about Jesus. They were worried about the people around them because they were blinded by their own desires. May it never be said of us that we are blinded by our own desires. In chapter 22, Jesus puts to silence the Sadducees and the Pharisees gather together and they try their hand and he shuts them up too. And from verse 46, we learn from that point forward, no man does ask him any more questions. Jesus is the king of questions and answers. In chapter 23, Jesus rebukes the hypocrites. He rightly calls them fools, blind, kingdom shutter uppers, child of hell may gnat strainers and camel swallowers, serpents and vipers, unable to escape the damnation of hell. And I want you to, to remember that he rightly did that. 
He didn't call names just to call names. He did that rightly. In Matthew 25, Jesus tells the parable of the ten virgins, tells the parable of the talents, and then sets for us the judgment scene. In verse 32, it says, Before him all nations of the earth are gathered. In verse 34, Then the king shall say, Come. And in verse 41, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. In Matthew 26, Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. He's betrayed in the, and, and prays in the garden. Peter defends Jesus. And in verses 54 and 56 of Matthew 26, all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Romans 3 verse 4 says, Yea, let God be found true, and every man a liar. God kept every word that he ever spoke. Matthew 27, we're running out of time. Jesus' um, crucifixion here. He stands before Pilate, and Pilate finds him innocent, yet condemns him, the guilty condemning the just. But subsequently, Pilate will one day stand before him that he condemned. And he will hear two of the most dreaded phrases any man could ever hear. He's going to hear, depart from me, ye cursed. And he's going to hear this phrase, Matthew 27, 19. Have nothing to do with thou just, this just man. He'll look over after being condemned and his wife will say, I told you so. What man would ever want to hear those two phrases, right? Above his head is a sign that says, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And the irony is profound. The King of Kings hangs on a cross, bearing the sins of humanity. The just died for the unjust, the righteous for the sinner. The greatest manifestation of love during the greatest manifestation of hate. The epitome of mercy for the merciless mob. The King of Kings for the chief of sinners. The Lord of Lords for the licentious and the lewd, Jesus knowing from all eternity the horrors that he would be facing. I have a baptism to be baptized with and how I am straightened until it be accomplished. He set his face like a flint, Isaiah 50, 6 and 7. He gave his back to the beaters. He turned his cheek for those who would pluck his beard out and smite him in the face. Is it for me, dear Savior, thy glory and thy rest? For me so weak and sinful, how shall I be so blessed? The resurrection, Matthew 28, unveils the climax of the gospel, the empty tomb. Jesus rises from the dead, conquering the grave, crushing the head of the serpent. He commissions his disciples, saying, All authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. The risen Christ, the King, commissions his followers to make disciples of all nations, spreading the message of his kingdom. No king can match his power, no rival to his throne. No king could calm the stormy seas, save Jesus and he alone. No king could make the blind man see, the lame to walk again. No king could heal the leper or make dead men live again. No king confounds the wisest men and puts them all to shame, save one man. He's the king of kings. And Jesus is his name. Matthew masterfully presents Jesus as the king of the Jews, the Messiah who fulfills all prophecies. His teachings, miracles, crucifixion, and resurrection affirm his divine authority as the king of kings. As we study the gospel, may we recognize Jesus not only as an historical figure, but as the eternal king who invites us into his kingdom, a kingdom marked by love, justice, and redemption. How does that affect you? How does that affect me? King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Thank you.
It's time for us to consider gathering around the Lord's table. This is the centerpiece of our worship, if you will. We're going to sing number 709, and then we will partake of Lord's Supper. We live in a busy world. Uh, I'm not sharing any sort of earth-shattering news with anybody by saying that. Uh, <clears throat> and because of that, uh, we, uh, we've, we've developed ways to, to remember things uh, because we know that if we don't, we're going to forget things. We've got things like to-do lists at, in the simplest form to help us remember things. Most of the time, I lay that down and I forget what I've done with it. So we also have... Um, Cell phones, right? We can set reminders on our cell phones to remind us that we need to do this, or we need to take care of that. You can get as elaborate as calendars with color coding and for certain events and certain people. And <clears throat> we, we have made, in our limited wisdom, man has made ways to try and help us to remember to do things. Of course, God knew that we would be a forgetful person uh, and in his infinite wisdom, he, he created a way for us to not forget the sacrifice that Christ made on our behalf. Of course, uh, in Luke 22, when Christ instituted the Lord's Supper, <clears throat> he used that phrase, this do in remembrance of me. Um, and it's as simple as two emblems. It's the bread, the fruit of the vine. Of course, we know that the, the, the bread uh, represents Christ's broken body that was beaten uh, and hung on the cross on our behalf, 
that we might have that hope of eternal life. And of course, the, the fruit of the vine that <clears throat> symbolizes or represents the, uh, the, the blood that was shed on, on our behalf. Uh, so as we get ready to partake of these emblems, let's, um, and remember that sacrifice, remember what Christ did, uh, the life that he lived and, and the pain and the suffering that he endured for you and for me. Let's focus our hearts, let's focus our minds, our thoughts on Christ, his life, uh, that sacrifice that he made on our behalf as we get ready to partake of these emblems. Let's go to God in prayer. <clears throat> Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you now, Lord, uh, thankful for this opportunity that we have to, to reflect on the life that Christ lived, Lord, and, and remember the, uh, the, the pain and the suffering that he endured uh, on our behalf. Uh, pray, Lord, that as we as we focus our thoughts on Christ and his, his sacrifice, Lord, pray that uh, we'll take this bread uh, in a manner pleasing in your sight. And these things we pray in your son's precious holy name. Amen. Let's continue in prayer. Again, Father, our, our gratitude continues as we try to figure a way through these emotions, Lord, thinking about Jesus' death, how saddening it is to think about the blood that was spilled and how many ways it was spilled in the bloody mess that the King became for us, Father, and for our salvation. At the same time, Lord, we are eternally grateful we're overjoyed at the price that was paid and Jesus' willingness to suffer through a life of endurance, to, to suffer and lead to a death like this in order to shed his blood. And we thank you, Lord, and we pray that as we take this cup that represents that beautiful blood, that you would um, accept our, our worship to you this morning. We pray that it would be honorable to you and to his sacrifice. We pray, Lord, this will set the tone for our days and for our, our lives as we live for him, Father, we thank you again for this blood, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Let's give thanks for the offering. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful to live in a nation such as we do, where we're so blessed. You give us so much each and every day. The means we have to provide a living for ourselves, for our family, the health that we have, so much, Father. And we take this time to give back to you as we've been so richly blessed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And if you would, please stand if it's convenient for you. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Very deep we sank within, shaking to rise a war. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me now say. Richie, 
He was the preacher for the McKaysville Church of Christ for 27 years and now works with the Jacksonville congregation uh, since April of 2021, so going on three years now, with the support of his wife, uh, Lynn, of 27 years, and his daughter, Nina. He has been a very great asset uh, to God's kingdom over the years. In keeping with the theme of the lectureship, Jesus Christ, the center of the Bible, Brother Richie's topic this morning is in Mark, he is the servant of God. Brother Keith. They were the twelve. They had been chosen. Jesus had prayed before he selected them and God gave them to our Lord and our Savior to be his apostles. Apparently, it was not uncommon for them to discuss who was going to be the greatest. And in the book of Mark chapter 10, we see two brothers, James and John, trying to sidestep the rest. I want to be on your right hand and I would like to be on your left hand. The other apostles were a little upset at that. And when we look at verse 42, But Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to diakonese from diakoneo, but to wait upon, to serve. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. We are going to be using this morning, Mark chapter 10, 42 through 45, as a springboard for the topic of the hour, which is, in the gospel of Mark, he, that is Jesus, is the servant of God. Four points in the lesson will be yours. Point number one, we will observe that Jesus Christ as the servant of God submitted. Point number two, we will behold that Jesus Christ, the servant of God, sold. Point number three, we will see that Jesus Christ as the servant of God in the Gospel of Mark showed. And lastly, in point number four, we will take note that Jesus Christ in the Gospel of Mark, as the servant of God, sacrificed. Now, last hour, Robbie preached a magnificent lesson on the King of kings and the Lord of lords. What a polar opposite this hour. We're going to see that it is through his righteous servitude he became the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But one cannot become a servant without number one in our first point, Submitting. Jesus Christ, the servant of God, submitted. If you look in the book of Mark chapter 1, beginning with verse 9, going through verse 11, we read these words, And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the Spirit, like a dove, descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven, saying, Thou art 
my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, we need to look and consider something about the baptism of John. If you go up to verse 4, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Eis of a sin hamartion. Same three Greek words that are also found in the book of Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. For the remission of sins. Eis of a sin hamartion. It means exactly what you think it means. Here in John chapter, or Mark chapter 1 and verse 4, it means exactly the same in Acts 2.38. means exactly the same in Acts 2.38 as it means in the book of Mark chapter 1 and verse 4. So then why was Jesus baptized? Many people are quick to use this passage as a reference to say, well, see, it's not for the remission of sins, for Jesus was sinless. We understand that, Hebrews 4.15. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22, but there's more to it, you see. We understand that. So why was he baptized? When you look at John, in the book of John, verse chapter 1 and verse 6, you'll see that there was a man sent from God whose name was John. You'll also take note in verse 33 in the book of John chapter 1 that God sent John the Baptist to baptize. John's message was God's message. John's baptism was God's baptism. And when we look at the book of Mark chapter 11, Jesus was confronted by chief priests, scribes, and elders. And they said, by what authority do you do these things? When you look at verse 30, Jesus says, I'll answer that question if you'll answer mine. Here's the question, verse 30, the baptism of John. Was it from heaven or of men? You know the answer. It was from heaven. Jesus submitted to something that was from heaven. Now we see the parallel account of Mark chapter 1, 9 through 11, in Matthew chapter 3, where Jesus came to John to be baptized of him. And in verse 14 and 15, we have a little insight in Matthew chapter 3 that Mark does not give us. There's a conversation that goes on between Jesus Christ and John the Baptist. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee. And comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it, allow it to be so now, for thus it becometh us, and underline this if it's not underlined in your Bibles in verse 15 of Matthew 3, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Now if you do not have a cross reference beside that verse, please write Psalm 119 verse 172. My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. Jesus is saying this to John. Allow it, for thus it becometh us to fulfill the commandments of God. It was the Father's will. What did Jesus come for? John chapter 6, verse 38. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. He submitted to what the Father wanted. John's message and John's baptism was from heaven. It was from God the Father, and Jesus submitted himself to it. Those that did not, we read about in the book of Luke chapter 7. In Luke chapter 7, verse 29, and all the people that heard him, and the publicans, justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves being not baptized of him. You mean to tell me that these Pharisees and these lawyers and, and all others that heard John's message repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand? And John's message that baptism was a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, when they heard that and they rejected that, that they rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized, that's what the inspired Luke says. That's what God's Word says. Jesus submitted Himself to the Father. And I want you to take note that many people today don't want to do that. 
Now, the baptism that we're baptized with, because we are sinful beings, we do sin and we have sinned, our baptism is for ace of a sin, harmartion, for the forgiveness of sins. But many people reject it. Notice very carefully the wording, and you're going to see it kind of come together in the book of Romans chapter 10, beginning with verse 1, where Paul writes, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear him record that they have a zeal of God but not according to knowledge, but they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Those individuals who hear the word, reject the word, do not obey the word, cannot be a servant. Many people in the world say they are. Many people in the world say, I feel him right here in my heart, but yet they reject the baptism for the remission of sins. And they reject the counsel of God against themselves when they do. Refusing to submit themselves, they cannot become servants. Now, I want us to go to point number two. We're going to spend a little time on this one. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the servant of God, and we observe how he sowed. He sowed. Not only did he submit himself, right after he submitted himself, what did he begin to do? When you look at the book of Mark, chapter 1, and verse 14. Now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee Preaching. Now, I'm going to pause. I'm not going to go any further, but I want you to take note of what he was doing. He was evangelizing. He was preaching. He was sowing. You go on down to about verse 35, and we see Jesus. Listen very carefully. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there prayed. And Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when they found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also. For therefore I came forth, or came I forth. He came to do some preaching. He came to spread the good news. He came to spread the gospel. He came to do some preaching, and that's exactly what he was doing. Evangelism is of the utmost importance to Jesus Christ. And when we think about Jesus Christ, the servant, we think about his submission, but number two, his sowing. You know, in the book of Matthew 10, we see the limited commission. When you come to the book of Matthew chapter 28 and Mark also, chapter 16, you see a greater commission, don't you? He's sending people to preach. Mark chapter 16, verse 15, go ye into all the world and do what? Preach. <coughs> Yet many people today are not doing that. Many congregations today are not evangelizing. Many congregations today just exist. They come together and there are many people that say, I would like many, many older preachers. When they get into the twilight years of their preaching career, they, they have this mindset, I would like to go to a small country congregation and that be my retirement congregation, my retirement work. And what happens? They have no intent in growing that congregation, no intent in evangelizing in the community. They just want to prepare sermons or maybe preach sermons that they prepared years ago and meet on Sunday morning, meet on Sunday night, meet on Wednesday night, and that's it. They just want to exist. Jesus preached. He was the servant of God, and so must his church. His name was Jamel Dunn. July 9th, 2017, Jamel, a disabled man, was walking by a retention pond. He stumbled and he fell in. He was flailing his arms 
trying to keep his head above water. There were four teenagers standing right there. And you would think, man, that's great. I bet they saved him. No. Listen very carefully what they did. They pulled out their cell phones and they hit video and they recorded him. And they began to mock him saying, come on, you need to try a little harder. Uh, why did you get in the pond in the first place? These four teenagers, ages 14 to 16, did nothing, nothing at all to save that man. They watched the man drown. His wife reported him missing. A few days later, they found his body. They began to share the video, which they thought was humorous and funny. But brethren, those that sit in the pews and do not seek to save souls and evangelizing are no better than those four teenagers. Throw out the lifeline. Across the dark wave, there is a brother whom someone should save, somebody's brother. Oh, the, who then will dare to throw out the lifeline, his peril to share? Throw out the lifeline to danger fraught men, sinking in anguish where we've never been. Waves of temptation and billows of woe will soon hurl them out where the dark waters flow. Soon will the season of rescue be o'er. Soon will they reach eternity shore. Haste then, my brother, no time for delay. Throw out the lifeline and save them today. Are you evangelizing? You may be a servant you've submitted, but are you sowing? And as Robbie has already mentioned, and I'll look at the parallel account in the book of Mark chapter 4, Jesus even taught it by parable. In Mark chapter 4, verse 3, Hearken, behold, there went a sower to sow by the wayside, in stony places, in the thorns, and on good ground. The parable and the explanation can be found in verse 14. The sower soweth the word. What are we to teach? What are we to preach? Now, some of you may be saying, Oh, that's the preacher's job. You can't throw that on the congregation. That's the job of the preacher. What I want you to do is remember something. Acts chapter 8, when you look at verses 1 through 4, especially verse 1 and verse 4, and Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church which, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Now, when you look at verse 4, then they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Who was scattered abroad? The church. The church. And what were they preaching? The gospel. Now, when you go back to Mark chapter 1 and verse 14, you're going to take note that Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom of God. And when you look at the book of Mark chapter 2, Verses 1 and following, what you're going to take note of, especially verse 2, is when Jesus came into Capernaum and the house was filled to capacity and beyond, what did he do? He preached the Word. He preached the Word. Too many brethren have the mindset that now it is comedy hour at the Apollo. Now it is storytelling time at the library. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give one illustration, one story after another. Nothing wrong with illustrations. You hit the illustration, you get back to preaching the Word. I went one time and with my dad to Colorado, and we visited a congregation. I searched for a sound congregation, found one I thought, and here's what happened. The Sunday morning Bible class was marvelous. Oh, that man did a masterful job in, in teaching God's Word. But the sermon, oh, there was a passage from the book of Matthew that was thrown up on the screen behind the preacher. It was never read. 
never quoted, never alluded to. That whole lesson was one story after another story, after another story, after another story. In the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto stories, fables. Brethren, Jesus Christ submitted. Jesus Christ sold. He didn't tell one joke after another joke after another joke, and it wasn't storytelling time. Now, his parables were his illustrations, but then he got to the heart of the matter, and he pricked the hearts. God's Word still ought to be pricking the hearts of people. Number three, Jesus showed. Jesus showed. When we think about Jesus showing, I want us to look at two different things. He showed his devotion. And by the way, I forgot I even had subpoints. But Jesus showed. He showed, number one, his devotion to God. I want you to take note of just how devoted he was to God and to others. When you look back at, at Mark chapter 1 and verse 35, and in the morning rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. You know, I remember reading stories of some of the restoration preachers and some even of more modern times, such as Brother Franklin Camp, who would get up at 4 a.m. every morning and begin their studies. And I was like, why? Oh, well, why would anybody want to do that? And then you consider Mark 1.35. Jesus did that. He was devoted with devotion time with his Father. He longed for a personal relationship and had that personal relationship with God the Father, and we all too as well. I have begun the practice years ago of getting up at 3.30 in the morning, getting ready, and being at the office at 4 or 4.30 in the morning. Not every morning, though. I have about two or three mornings a week that I do this. I used to do it every morning, but the older I get, my body's saying, you need a little bit more sleep. Young men, preacher students, when you get out in the field, you're going to find that there are times that you go in at regular time. And you begin to open your Bible. You begin to put your, your sermons together. You begin to build an outline. You begin to, to devote some time to God and the study of His Word. And then there is a phone call. And then there's a text. And then there's an email. Then there's another phone call. And before you know it, half of your day is gone. Try it. Get up a little earlier. Those that are not preachers, that are, get up a little earlier. Devote some time. Somebody says, I just don't have time to read and devote time to God right now. I, it's just too hard. The hours that I work, I remember years ago, I worked long hours at Levi Strauss. And I remember somebody telling me to try something. And I tried it. And you know what? It worked very well. I never forgot it. Back then, I had a cassette, a cassette player for my pickup truck. Young people, I don't know if you know what a cassette is. <laughs> but I had a cassette. And I would put that cassette in. And it was Alexander Scorby reading the New Testament or the Bible, and I would put it in and I would listen to as many chapters as I could on my way to work. After I clocked out, I got back in the vehicle, I rewound, yes, you had to rewind it, and I would listen to those same chapters back home. 
Then I got home, and it did not take me very long to read through those chapters. So I got through three or four or five chapters three times in one day. Try it. Jesus, he showed his devotion to the Father. He prayed. He spent time with the Father, but he also spent time with people and devoted time to others. I want you to take note, if you will, of Mark chapter 1 and verse 26. Mark chapter 1, 26 through 28. Jesus, and you don't even have to get out of Mark chapter 1. This is amazing to me. You don't even get out of Mark chapter 1. Robbie went through the whole book of Matthew. I'm, not, I'm barely getting out of Mark chapter 1 with mine. Mark chapter 1, 26 through 28. Jesus heals, cast out an evil spirit out of a man that was being tormented he took time. He showed that he cared. He took time to help that individual. When you look on a little further in verses 29 through 31, you see he heals Peter's, mo uh, Peter's mother-in-law. By the way, in Luke's account, she's not, she doesn't just have a fever. She's great with fever. And then she begins to serve afterward. That's amazing. You know when you run a fever... How tired you are after running a fever and a high fever at that. Your, your energy is just, just depleted. But yes, she gets up and she begins to serve. Jesus took time to heal her. When you look on, he healed in, in verses 32 through 34, all kinds of illnesses, all kinds of sicknesses. In 40 through 42, we see Jesus taking time with a leper. And he heals this leper. When other people would not give him so much as the time of day, they were scared to death. Jesus took time and healed him. Now, in verse 41, we see why Jesus did these things. It's a word that starts with the letter C. And you'll find it, listen very carefully, in Mark chapter 1, verse 41. Mark 5, 19. Mark 6, 34. Mark 8 and verse 2. And Mark 9 and verse 22, it is the word compassion. He had compassion. Yes, he showed his authority over these illnesses and, and these sicknesses. Robbie mentioned as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, he had authority over these things and he showed his authority. But in so doing, he also showed his compassion and his love and his devotion, not only to God, but to others and spending time Spending time helping those that were in need. When you think about all of these things, remember Mark chapter 12, verses 29 through 31. When one asked Jesus, what is the first commandment? He said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. That's submitting. That's sowing. But the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You know, when you look at Mark chapter 8, especially in verse 2, and he sees the multitude that they had been with him three days and they didn't have anything to eat, he had compassion on them because of that. He knew exactly what they were going through. He knew what day three was all about because he had 40. I know what they're going through. He took time. There was a little boy that was in a grocery store. He got up to the counter, and that little boy had two things, two items. He had eggs and bread. Waiting at home were three siblings. The little boy was frail and skinny, peaked. The man at the counter knew him. He wasn't a stranger in the store, but he had helped him about all he could do and stay afloat at the store because he had other people that were in need. And, and the little boy put his money on the counter. And he said, I'm sorry, son, I can't help this time. He said, that's not enough money. He said, you'll have to put one of the items back. A man standing behind him, the little boy, said these words, I will take care of it. And he said, not only that, I want you to go through the store with me, and what we're going to do 
is we're going to get some more things, more items for you. And he said, I have, I have some brothers and, and a sister. He said, we'll get enough. And they got up to the counter. When they got up to the counter and the man paid for all of the groceries, the man helped the little boy take it home. But before they walked out that store, the little boy looked at the man and said, Are you Jesus? The man said, No. No, I said, I, I'm not Jesus. But I'm related to him. When you look at Mark chapter 3 and verse 35, for whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and mother. Jesus Christ as the servant of God submitted. Jesus Christ as the servant of God sowed. Jesus Christ as the servant of God showed. And lastly, Jesus Christ as the servant of God sacrificed. I'm not going to dip too much into my thought here because I don't know where other speakers are going to go this week. But friends, we cannot fully fathom what Jesus gave up. He sacrificed. When you think about 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor that ye through his poverty might be rich. We'll never fathom that truly and probably through all of eternity. But we'll be glad that we'll be with him. And we'll be thankful for that. When we think about Jesus in Mark chapter 1, 35 again, when he went out into a solitary place and prayed, Simon and those that were with him, they followed after him, and when they found him, they said, All men seek for thee. He gave up time. He gave up time. He gave his body a living sacrifice. You know, I know of preachers that travel. They travel all over the country, and they preach the truth, and they preach it soundly. And they get home, and I think sometimes I just don't see how in the world they did it. But when I read the Gospels of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, in those three short years that He ministered to God, ministered in service to God, the Father, and ministered to people, I don't see how in the world He did it. I don't see how He had the strength to do it as a man. But He sacrificed His body as a living sacrifice. Romans chapter 12 Verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. We must be living sacrifices as well. But he sacrificed himself. He gave himself. It was willing. The Father sent him. And when we look at Mark chapter 14, verse 36... We see Jesus praying in Gethsemane, Gethsemane. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, listen very carefully. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou will. Philippians 2 is a good place to go in a cross-reference to this in verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. I want to pause. He saw that as not something to be grasped at. He's deity. But he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a what? Servant. And was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You see, now we've come full circle. Jesus Christ, as the servant of God, submitted. He sowed. He showed and he sacrificed. 
Are you this morning willing to sacrifice your life to be a living sacrifice in service to God by submitting to His will? In the book of John chapter 8 and verse 24, Jesus says we must believe. In the book of Luke chapter 13, verses 3 and 5, Jesus says we must repent. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. We must, dear friends, confess the sweet name of our Lord and our Savior. Romans chapter 10 and verse 10, With the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then we must be baptized. Ace of a sin, hamartion, for the forgiveness of sins. And then you can begin your life of servitude. It may be that you're here and you obeyed the gospel many years ago. And you were once a faithful servant. But in your walk, your Christian walk, you have found that I have not sowed like I ought to sow. I have not showed how I need to be showing with devotion. And I have not been as determined as being a living sacrifice as my Lord was, and I want to follow Him. Make me a servant. Lord, make me like you. For you are a servant, make me one too. For you are a servant, I want to be one as well. Have that attitude. Have that attitude and come to God in full compliance and submission as together we stand and sing. What a fantastic start uh, for the lectureship. The theme will continue this week, uh, Jesus Christ, the center of the Bible, where we, where we will explore 
uh, His presence throughout the New Testament. Please uh, consider coming back tonight at 6 o'clock. Brother Robbie Eversoll Sr. will uh, continue from the book of Luke. We would like to thank uh, Robbie Jr. and Brother Keith for two wonderful messages portraying Jesus in the books of Matthew and Mark. Hopefully that has given you resolve to go find him throughout the Bible yourself. We're going to sing a verse or two of a, another song, and then we will be dismissed in prayer. No tears in heaven, verse number one. No tears in heaven, no sorrows in So thankful for this time that we've had this morning to come together to study your word, to worship you in spirit and in truth, to sing songs to your high and excellent name, to partake of the Lord's Supper, remembering the death of your son, Jesus Christ. And we're so thankful for the freedom that we have this morning to do all these things without fear of persecution. Uh, we're so thankful for the guest speakers this morning, Robbie Jr. and Keith and their willingness to preach the gospel this morning. We're so thankful for this lectureship, this time that we have where speakers from all around can come and proclaim the truth of your word in this wonderful series. And we pray that your name is glorified during this event, that you bless everyone who attends, that we strive to grow stronger and closer to you, as we study and learn more about your son, Jesus. Uh, we pray that you bless us now during this day. I uh, pray that you keep us safe as we travel. And pray that you keep us safe until the next appointed time. Dear Lord, we're so mindful of those who were mentioned this morning that were on the sick list. Uh, you know the names of each one. We pray that they can be restored back to a better portion of health. And we know, dear Lord, we're... Uh, flawed, imperfect beings. We do fall short and make mistakes from time to time. It's so easy to do so in the sinful world, but we're so thankful for your grace and your mercy. The fact that you continually cleanse us of our sins whenever we fall short, and we know that, that wouldn't be possible without your son Jesus, who shed his blood on the cross for us all. We pray all these things in his name. Amen. <laughs> 